you have four girls and two groups. There's only two guys that they're apparently are interested in the entire club because the place is empty. Um, basically, they start to fight and insult each other, uh, you know, defame each other as being both sets of prostitutes uh, just to try and capture the guys and take both of them home. Experience. Всем привет and welcome back to another episode of the Volka Volkas with me, Connor Klein. This is the Zara Experience and today I'm shooting from the roof, the roof of my apartment, my Airbnb apartment here in the center of Odessa, uh, Ukraine. As you can see behind me, just there's the Black Sea right over there. So this is kind of a magnificent uh, little perk I got with this apartment actually to climb up through the dormer window over there of my apartment and then I get this view of the city so pretty pretty sweet I have to say so that's not why you're here to know exactly where I'm hanging out in Odessa because you're also watching this on a, de on a delay of course because I'm recording this in uh, kind of early October mid-October almost uh, and as you can see the weather is amazing in Odessa like it's 21 degrees Celsius and it's October and we're in Ukraine so yeah, that gives you an indication, but that's not why you're here. You're here because you want to listen to the stories, the stories I started uh, telling you a few episodes episodes ago. I think we're on, this is the fourth episode now in this series of stories from the first time I went traveling in Eastern Europe with my sensei. My first trip to Eastern Europe, I document that for you guys uh, in episode nine, so you can learn from the mistakes that I made when I was a newbie here in Eastern Europe. At this stage, I have a little bit more experience and I'm traveling with my, with my friend, who doesn't speak Russian, I of course at this time do speak some Russian and that kind of shows you maybe the difference of how things have developed. Uh, the reason I'm of course telling you all these stories is because number one you asked for it when I pulled pulled you guys on my social media and also there's something for you to learn in all of this these anecdotes it's not just purely uh, entertainment to listen to me but if you're planning to travel or you want to be inspired to travel then uh, this is why I developed this series of stories to kind of uh, help you with that. If you're planning to come to Eastern Europe of course Write me a message, why not? Send me an email at connorkline at czarexperience.com or just find me on Instagram. My handle there is czarexperience and write me a DM, direct message, and then we, maybe we can chat. Maybe you need some help with your trip, some advice, I offer Skype coaching, all that good stuff, and also help you with your, your trips here. Also have the free courses, look below uh, in the description to this video. Or if you're listening to this on the podcast um, version as opposed to YouTube, then I'll put that in the show notes. And there you can look at my, my free courses. And of course, after that, there are the premium courses that you can decide whether to invest in or not. But the stuff down there is free. That's in the description in any case. So in the last episode, I left off in Vinitsa. Now, Vinitsa is a city in the center west of Ukraine. And then the next city on our itinerary, this 12-day incredible rampage through uh, Romania, part, part of just Bucharest basically, uh, Moldova, northern Moldova, through Ukraine is the capital, Kiev, or Kiev, uh, in the center, well, north center of Ukraine on the Dnieper River. My friend, of course, had never been to Eastern Europe before. Uh, to give you more of a um, kind of an overview of what's going on politically in the country, of course, this is just after the Euromaidan revolution, this is in 2014. And they were still, this is like in April, so they protest, um, well, they were victorious basically against the, the incumbent president at the time, Viktor Yanukovych, uh, in late February uh, 2014. And we we're going there two months afterwards. Now, Maidan, which is probably, which is synonymous with the revolutions, either uh, the Orange Revolution in 2004 or the later Euro Maidan Revolution, um, is the central square. It's like Victory Square in the center of Kiev. And that was actually still more or less occupied by the protesters or well not all the protesters obviously most of them had left but there were definitely still factions and they were there and they organized and they actually controlled access uh, to to the square now you could go in by metro of course um, but for example at night when the metro was closed they actually patrolled and controlled the central square Maidan square um, so we arrive in Kiev and I guess to give you an overview I and mean, give you a little bit more of a of a taste for what it was like. Basically, even people from Kiev have been scared to go to my, the center of Kiev of the city during the protests, um, just because, of course, there's a risk. I mean, 100 people, more than 100 people were, were killed during the protests. And 
I have been there. I'm going to align that, of course, in another future episode of the Volcast, what it was actually like to be on the square itself during the, the revolution. I was there on two occasions in December 2013 and February 2014. Now, the one thing that was really noticeable was the cost of rent in the center because, of course, no tourists were coming to uh, Kiev at the time. And it was incredibly cheap. I remember taking two bedroom apartments with a jacuzzi for like 20 20 euros, it was even less than 20 euros, probably 20 US dollars uh, per night in a capital where that normally costs, at, before the, the revolution, it cost probably 100. So it was like 20% of the price. So that's a good tip for you if you go to places that are in civil strife or some sort of conflict. It is noticeably cheaper in places where normally there would be international visitors. So that's tip number one from today's video that you got out of it. That's one reason to go. Of course, during the revolution, there were security risks, people were killed. I'm not saying that should go there just because it was it was cheaper and even after the revolution when everything is safe um, it was still incredibly cheap compared to what had been before it was more or less the same price there were still no international visitors and even uh, local people in Kiev were still not coming to the center because they were worried about uh, these militias that were controlling um, the square um, so we arrive and basically it's in the aftermath there's still the barricades for my friend who had been there was really uh, obviously interesting to see the aftermath. Uh, they had a lot of memorials um, at that stage, obviously the people who had died um, um, along the street leading up to the parliament, also on the square on Maidan. So we went and we saw, I mean, I saw that again, but really interesting what we, what we did is we went out to Yanukovych, uh, his former residence, uh, which is just a little bit in the north of Kiev along the river, along the river Dnipro. And at the time, it was like, obviously they had been, the government had been replaced, there was a new interim government, but there were still a lot of, uh, well, small areas of the city still controlled by, the, by uh, militant groups or paramilitary groups, uh, for example, Maidan, but also actually his former residence. So we actually took a marshuka up there, uh, got to his residence. Uh, I think we got to the village where it's at, and then we took a taxi on. Today, this is a museum, so I really encourage you to go and see it if you're in Kiev. But at the time, we were really sure we were going to find when we got there. And the first thing that struck me when we got there was people were selling us maps. Yes, maps to uh, Yanukovych's um, residence. I was thinking, why would we need a map? We're just going to see the guy's house, right? I realized after we started walking around why we needed a map. It was, it was like a, how do you say, a royal... Um, country residence basically it was enormous the thing stretched on we never got to the end of it the run the map thing like just we got lost almost um, and I remember the ostriches because he was famous for having ostriches and they were there and then there was this like incredibly gaudy um, I guess a barbecue I don't know what you call it it's like a marble kind of barbecue stand but I think it was like it's hard to how four five meters i don't know you can see it probably online it was enormous and pretty gaudy uh, and then they had a boat a barge full of uh, expensive or ornate um, porcelain or well, not even but just like silverware and uh, other things that were in the house like decorations decor he didn't have particularly good taste in my opinion uh, yanukovych another reason for him to be gone and of course how he got the money for all this well yeah uh, not through uh, normal channels uh, probably I guess through some sort of uh, corruption since he was able to of course make this in excess largely in excess way in excess of his of course official salary whatever he's supposed to be making so we get there we walk around it was really interesting that it was controlled by these paramilitary groups and they were there they had guns slung over their shoulder uh, but no one had looted any of the stuff this is what really struck me about the aftermath of the revolution what we found there um, same on Maidan uh, the shops I think there was one building maybe that had been smashed, the glass had been smashed, maybe. But like really, like none of the buildings have been looted. Um, people hadn't like ripped up stuff and tried to steal it or anything like that. It was really, really impressive actually that that was the spirit of changing the country uh, and getting rid of uh, Yanukovych. Uh, hadn't let the people been opportunistic and just becoming thieves uh, like, like the guys they were trying to throw out. Um, so that was really, really fascinating to see, especially at this palace and to see, chat to the to the paramilitaries who were there uh, and just see that these guys, they must have been, like, I assume they didn't have any money, but they still at the same time weren't willing to steal uh, any of the stuff that was there that Yanukovych left. And today you can, I assume, see it in his, uh, what's now a museum out of his former, former residence. So that was really interesting uh, to observe how disciplined they were in the aftermath. Now, another thing that's always a, a bit of a myth about, and I think might be interesting for you to hear, is the language thing in Ukraine. A lot of the, um, we'll say, 
pro-Russian media always painted this as kind of like oppressing Russian speakers. But one thing I observed when I was at Maidan and afterwards when these paramilitary groups were controlling the square still is that Pravi Sektor, uh, which is a Ukrainian nationalist group and was kind of always the boogeyman on pro-Russian media at the time, uh, they, they spoke to each other in Russian. Yeah, the Ukrainian nationalists were speaking Russian. So the whole idea that this was um, a huge ling language issue and it was also in the Western media portrayed that, oh, language is so important if they, you know, everybody has to speak Ukrainian. Even the Ukrainian experience, extremists, not all of them I assume, but a lot of them who were from Russian speaking families or backgrounds, they spoke in Russian to each other, for goodness sake. So it was also interesting for me to observe in the aftermath, it's not, not just during the revol revolution itself. So we, we did this tour. I actually had some meetings, because um, um, uh, uh, diplomatic meetings actually with um, some uh, EU officials at the time. So I took a night off from all the craziness we were doing, obviously, on the trip on the way there, taking in the atmosphere of post revolution uh, Ukraine. For my friend, of course, it was really, really fascinating to arrive and see all this uh, and actually not be really in danger, because obviously it's over to a certain extent. And then we went out and we went to party obviously in the evening i think it was like later in a few days later in the week because it took a night or two off to re recuperate a little bit i definitely needed it after vinitsa and we decided to go out to a club that is a club i would normally go to it's called sari babushka it's kind of a more traditional i guess a little bit more soviet style club and as i was saying no one like local people in kiev were still scared to come to the center of the city so there was no one it was bloody empty Right. So I've told you already that like coming there during just after the revolution, of course, accommodation was really, really cheap. It was interesting to see what was really going on uh, as opposed to relying on the media, which, you know, media anywhere is going to give you a certain perspective. And either it's because they have a personal agenda to push a lot of the time or particular politically slant or they're just lazy and they don't really research it properly for you. Uh, so that's why I always believe you have the opportunity. And you'll see when I talk about why it was actually on Maidan uh, during the revolution, go and see it for yourself. Make your, make, make your own decision, you know, your own opinion, form your own opinion based on like, personal experience if you, can, if you can do that at all. That's what I would say. And it was a lot cheaper. So we're there. It's pretty much an empty club. Um, my friend almost became a victim of a scam. <laughs> um, some girl, apparently the club had some sort of strip club associated with it. And of course, some girl started talking to him, uh, who later turned out to be a stripper in the strip club and ordered some bottle at her table. It was not outrageously expensive, the bottle, so I didn't get too upset about the, the misjudgment on that. Uh, because of course, she just wants to order something. She probably gets a, a percentage and gets a commission. So she's not interested in really talking to my friend. She's taking a break from work, drinking a glass of champagne, charging on the bill, making some extra money. So another thing for you to, guys to watch out for is like just always scope out who the person is uh, because she even told us where she was working afterwards. But it wasn't like an outrageous um, price bottle like I've told you guys about in previous videos, like four to five hundred euros, nothing like that. It was like maybe 30 or 40, which is still kind of mid range in at the time in, in Kiev, maybe uh, maybe even a little bit cheap. So um, we're there in the club, not much going on. We're about to leave because like there's no real point in hanging out here anymore. We'd had dinner, which is also quite common in uh, nightclubs in Ukraine. Um, and this is five years ago, uh, five years ago. So we had some su sushi, as I like to say, traditional Ukrainian food, kind of, because uh, it's so common here. And two girls come in. They're super excited to meet my friend. Um, we start talking to them, hanging out, dancing. Uh, they go to the, to the, to the bathroom. Uh, admittedly for a very long time so I'm there chilling with my buddy uh, these girls seem one of them seems very interested in him I'm not really feeling much of a vibe there two other girls actually come in in the meantime remember the club is basically empty all night uh, and they're also <laughs> very excited to see us um, again this is what I'm going to talk about novelty um, like if you're traveling somewhere where there's just like I guess little competition there is like if you went to Kiev today on any given night there's just like tons of foreign guys and just tons of guys in general because of course now this the situation is back to normal uh, and they also were interested in uh, hanging out and hooking up with us so I start making out one of the girls the second group eventually the two other girls come back and they're pretty upset because um, I don't know why I mean I wasn't really doing anything with them in the first place only talking but anyways they get a little bit jealous they basically tell me uh, yeah uh, those girls are prostitutes you shouldn't be with them you should come with us we're gonna go to our place you come with us for my friend I was like no I think I will hang out 
here my buddy comes over and says, are you going to come with me? I was like, no, I think I'm going to save my girl here. Then the second group of girls starts saying, those girls over there are prostitutes, they're whores, you should come with us. Uh, and then the four of us go to our, uh, your place or whatever, because we were obviously sharing a uh, two-bedroom apartment in the center. Uh, so it was just like this comical situation when there's like, scarcity right um you have four girls and two groups uh and they both there's only two guys that they're apparently are interested in the entire club because the place is empty um basically they start to fight and insult each other uh you know defame each other as being both sets of prostitutes uh just to try and capture the guys and take both of them home so this is something that you should really take out of. i mean for me it's more a comical situation we both basically took a girl from each group settled everything we were fair we were fair uh and um then the two, other, the, the two girls who were less pretty of the, the group, I guess, to be frank, uh, lost out. But they did make a good effort to try and wreck the chances of the other girls. So that's kind of the, I guess, the second lesson that you can take out of this video. That I've been talking about it already in several uh, parts of this series of stories. Is the fact that if you are more of a novelty by going to places that are less traveled or si to cities that are in a situation where it's going to be less touristic. Like, for example, you don't go in. The, you know, the high season August to Kiev, you maybe go a, a month or two earlier, for example, uh, then it's going to be a different experience for you. So yeah, that's how novelty can really play in your favor if you're traveling. And it doesn't necessarily have to be because we're talking about dating and girls and stuff like that. It can be in other situations, just the fact that, you know, local people are going to be more open to you and find you more interesting because you're more of a novelty for them in their situation. Uh, but definitely that's the only time we've ever had two groups the two of us have gone out and there's been two groups of girls fighting, literally fighting, defaming each other to see who would win because that's what scarcity does. Um, scarcity of supply. Um, and as I talked about in the last episode about Vinitsa on a Monday night, 70% girls. Um, here we have, I guess it was the opposite. Yeah, it's the same situation, right? So you only have uh, two options and there's four people competing. So that's something to bear in mind uh, as you travel and as you go pick where you're going to go out. The sun is setting here in Odessa. I'm probably running out of light very quickly. Uh, so I'm going to wrap up this um, episode of Vodcast a little bit earlier than I have in the others. Next leg of the trip is to Kharkov where really things go another go really crazy for us and then back to Kiev. Uh, if you have um, been to Kiev, uh, had a similar experience where you were a novelty factor, been at a revolution, it doesn't have to be in the form of Soviet Union, then let us all know in the comment section below because that's where we're building this great community of you guys who are really passionate about traveling here and are really investing in, in um, your own experiences and sharing them with me. So definitely go and share your experiences in the comment section below. As I said at the top of the video, if you're not a subscriber, if you're new to the channel, this may be your first time seeing the Zara experience with me, Connor Klein, then definitely subscribe. There's a red subscribe button there. Helps the channel out, helps with that algorithm and YouTube if you are, of course, watching the videos and you know interacting with them. Uh, and if, if you've enjoyed this one, strike the like button and make sure that you've whacked the notification bell beside the subscribe button so that you're notified when there's the next episode, when I go to Kharkiv in next week's episode, and you'll get that notification so you don't miss out. And I'm under pressure to, to end this, wrap this one up because I think everything is going to go dark. So I'm going to enjoy another beautiful um, autumns, the fall evening in Odessa, Ukraine. I will see all of you, all of your smiling, enthusiastic faces for Eastern Europe in the next episode of the Volcast or maybe in the middle of the week in my next video. It could be a tip Thursday. It could be another one of five reasons to date or not to date Ukrainian girls, something along that kind of uh, video. See you all soon. This Vidanya, Dopovachna from Odessa, Ukraine. Sar experience.